The Idaho Falls Earth Day Committee asked me to read a chapter from My Place Among Men. The popular pick is Groping a Grizzly. So settle in for a few minutes of screen time. I have photos and footage to go with it so we can turn it into a picture book. If you want to follow along while we're reading, turn to page 154. This is Groping a Grizzly. With bear biologist Brian Aber, there's no friendship at least not for the first few years while he avoids me. It's not because I'm a woman. A lot of his field technicians are women. It's because I'm a reporter. Brian doesn't trust the media. Not an original excuse, but it's what he's using. I hate getting lumped in with the media pile as someone not to trust. I know who I don't trust, and I make sure I don't match their traits. But Brian doesn't know that, not at first. He watches me work with other biologists for a few months. He watches my stories for plenty more months, and then he finally decides, I have skills, I'm in. So I let the trust start to build with the man sporting a beard as prickly as his personality. Despite that, we connect. I'll ask you to take off your sunglasses during an interview so the audience can clearly see your eyes and make a more intimate connection with you as a person. But I don't need you to lose the beard so I can connect. Beards don't bother me anymore, not even Brian's. I've earned my place in the woods with him, which has me hearing my mom in my head again. You really should be more careful, she would say, with sky is falling worry in her eyes. You take too many risks. I swear you don't have a danger, Jean. In this instance, I'm thinking she's wrong. I must have a danger, Jean. Why else would my hand hover over a pelt with a shaking tremor reaching all the way to my fingertips? I'm hesitating, but honestly, any sensible soul would pause when put in my position. I'm in the far back of the back country with a grizzly bear, and our run-in is no accident. There's really a small number of people worldwide that work with these species, and that's a pretty cool thing to be part of that and to help recover this population in the Yellowstone ecosystem. He's letting me in on his cool thing. I'm with him when he traps a grizzly bear in a dense forest of lodgepole pine in Island Park, Idaho. That's just outside of Yellowstone National Park. I'm witnessing one day in two decades of grizzly bear research in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We traveled a dizzying maze of dirt roads to reach the trap. I wouldn't even be able to find it on my own if I tried. But the site is marked a mile out with signs reading, Danger, do not enter. Only a handful of people know what goes on behind the signs, and I'm with them. I'm nervous. A reporter at a grizzly bear trap site? That's unheard of. I'm also giddy. I've always wanted to touch a grizzly bear <laughs> without losing my life. That's also unheard of. But I have to keep my head in the game or Brian will kick me out before I adjust to being in. I'm going along to tell the story of the science behind the bears through video and photo. Grizzly bears landed on the endangered species list about the same time bald eagles did, back in the 70s. I never saw a grizzly bear in my school gym like I did a bald eagle. This is my first time seeing a grizzly, and I intend to touch that bear, but there's plenty of work to do before that hovering hand holds wild hair. As I unload my cameras, we talk in whispers. The wind is still. The woods around the trap are quiet and then there's a rumble. The noise sounds like an idling car buried in snow. The sound spreads from the trap, through the trees, to the trucks, vibrating my tripod. It's the growl of a grizzly. I lean in for a look through the bars on the trap's window. The grizzly throws a paw at the opening with a loud bang. I jump a lot and pee a little. <laughs> I'm uncomfortably close. But I don't back away, and I don't look away. This is my first grizzly. I study it, staring wide-eyed with my two close eyes that don't seem so close anymore. I lasted longer in the media business than the news director who made that ridiculous remark about my eyes way back when. I don't fret over my facial features anymore. I'm comfortable with me, including my quirks. Quirks, kinks, hitches, hang-ups. We all have them. It's best if we learn to shoulder them with dignity if they're going to stay despite how far behind we try to leave them. 
The animal I'm staring at has a quirk too. He's a sucker for an easy meal. That's why he's in a trap. Me enticed him to enter. Now I'm enticed to stare at him. The moment needs no soundtrack. So my long ago, too quiet voice doesn't need a shot of whiskey for volume. But my nerves might need one for soothing. The experienced researchers are looking at the same grizzly I'm looking at. It's not their first, but it's significant nonetheless. It's grizzly number 227, the first grizzly captured for research in modern day Idaho. That was back in 1994, when the population was close to blinking out. Number 227 likes rotten elk meat. He's been baited into a trap 12 times in 20 years. So that's kind of impressive. He's a 21 year old bear now. And um, it's kind of cool to see him and how he's gone through those years. Once the bear settles into a drug induced sleep, the team works quickly. They pull 440 pounds of bear out of the trap, put him on oxygen and start collecting hair and blood samples. They have 45 minutes to collect what they need and put a new GPS collar on number 227. I have the same amount of time to shoot video, take photographs, and sneak in that touch I'm itching for. It took me five years of solid storytelling to prove myself worthy of this bear trapping trip. I'm thrilled to work with Brian, even when he rolls his eyes at me as I lie down on the tarp next to him. His hands are in the bear's mouth, and my hands are all over my camera. Really, Milgate? he whispers. I whisper back. You do your job. I'll do mine. The rapport between us is stern, but well developed over our common interest. Brian knows bears like no other. And as a journalist, it's my job to know the know-it-alls. I watch Brian manhandle teeth in the bear's mouth, then move to its neck to tighten the screws on the new GPS collar. Hair samples are pulled. Blood is drawn. During all of this, I fight the light. Light is tricky at a trap site. A camera lens, no matter how much it costs, doesn't literally work like your iris. It adjusts based on how much light there is, but it gets confused by how much light there is when the light source is patchy. Grizzly trap sites have less than favorable lighting conditions because they're always in the shade. Hairy grizzlies overheat easily, so working on an unconscious bear in directly overhead sun for nearly an hour could mean death by heat stroke for the animal. The work has to be done in the shade, even in the shade of a tight growth of lodgepole pine trees. Light is patchy in there, especially when the wind blows branches and the sun sprinkles through. Just beyond the patchy light, our small square of working shade is immediately swapped for full sun. I'm always looking for full shade or full sun, but not both at the same time or half of each. That confuses the lens and creates shots that are either too dark or so overexposed that they look blown out with a white glow. The bear's life has priority over the life of my shot. So I continue to fight the light as inspection of the beast continues. There's an ugly wound from a recent bear fight that's repairing itself naturally with a mound of maggots. <laughs> yeah, maggots. <laughs> the old scar from a hunter's gunshot in 2009 is still trouble free. Number 227's teeth are wearing down. His weight is down too. He's aging. This is all documented before the bear's sleepy time tranquilizer runs out. The medicine wears off from nose to toes. The bear is starting to lick his lips. Time's up and my shaky hand is still hovering. The research crew quietly jokes about my hesitation. I quickly bite back, reminding them we are all kneeling around something that could kill us with one paw swipe. Finally, I dismiss the danger, like my mom says I always do, and I go for a grab of grizzly. No whiskey courage needed. The omnivore's coarse coat is deep, dense, and dirty. Just as for little boys on summer vacation, baths are optional for big bears too. I run my hand along the huge hump between the bear's shoulders. His breathing is extremely slow and deep. The calm, restful state of such a powerful brute is unsettling. This beast of a bear lives where I do. He swims the rivers I fish, and he eats the berries I pick. He doesn't really want to be anywhere near me. I feel the same about him when he's awake. But for this one moment, we are both harmless. 
His hair is covered in dandruff and dirt. It's wildly fierce, but I enjoy the feel of it like it's the finest fabric I've ever run my fingers across. He's walking around out here and he could pretty much have anything in there, Brian jokes. That's his way of telling me, time's up, stop touching. I pull my hand free, stand up, and step away. Grizzly number 227 is lifted back into the trap. Brian cleans up the outdoor operating room, then runs a rope and pulley system from the trap to the truck. This is how he'll open the trap at sunset, so the bear can run off with its new GPS collar, leaving the trap empty for the next unsuspecting bear. It is a recovered population now, should be delisted. That's a good feeling to, to work with that and be part of that. Witnessing that recovery is a good feeling too. There were fewer than 200 grizzly bears in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem when they landed on the endangered species list in 1975. I was two years old. They left the list in 2017 with more than 700 grizzlies in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. But they were relisted in 2018, so I'm still following their story. As we drive away from grizzly number 227, the trap door opens. Another collared grizzly bear runs out of the trap and out of sight. I've had my once in a lifetime touch a grizzly moment. My hands are still shaking. Touching a grizzly, even a sleeping one, will do that to you. In my 25 years of covering the outdoors, I've witnessed desperation and inspiration. I know the COVID-19 virus makes us all feel desperate, but we will be inspired again. Here's to open spaces, quiet graces, and wild places.